are listening to the Star Lores Podcast. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? Well, I was going to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. For over a millennia, the Republic had stood intact and relatively peaceful. The eras of great conflicts had passed, the Sith were thought extinct, and the Republic was left with the dominant government in the galaxy. While they did not hold complete dominance, its membership was counted in the vast majority of populated systems and worlds. Peace and trade had become emblematic of the Republic, who sought to rule through democratic principles and negotiation rather than through bl the blunt instrument of war, and had even gone through a demilitarization process. But it was not a perfect peace. There had always been worlds who did not join with the Republic, worlds that had felt that the galactic governments had been ineffectual or even illegitimate. For all its virtues, the Republic had many vices. Politicians, growing greedy and powerful, had also become corrupt. Unchallenged, many would seek to enrich themselves and their close circle of invested parties, such as interplanetary megacorporations, rather than represent the desires of their home populations. While the Republic may have governed through the democratic processes, the worlds that composed the interplanetary systems maintained autonomy enough to govern themselves in whatever way they saw fit. Some worlds existed in a seemingly paradoxical state of despotic local rule, while observing the democracy of the Republic. Yet more worlds, who felt the Republic had not done enough to curb piracy and illicit activities, working with criminal enterprises and allowing all manner of abhorrent practices to continue, such as slavery to continue, and yet others felt that the Republic had become too heavy-handed, becoming too enmeshed. Finally, there were some worlds that had always felt marginalized by the galactic government. Their interests pushed aside in favor of larger, more desirable electoral blocks. Those whose geographic locations at the edges of the galaxy and lack of exploitable resources made them unequal in the eyes of bureaucrats and politicians who spared nary a second thought to worlds that had never seen or cared to hear of. Finally, at the heart of all the discontent, there were groups actively working against the Republic from within. A core of malicious intended individuals who sought to destabilize and ultimately take the reins of sovereignty into their own hands. There were many who felt corruption had begun to fester at the heart of the Republic, and worried that the lumbering institutions had grown feeble, too slow and riddled with too much bureaucracy to be effective, while wealthy elites prioritized themselves over their fiduciary duties. The Separatist Crisis After the apparent weakness of the Republic was laid bare during the Naboo Crisis, when the world was blockaded and invaded by the Trade Federation, a small group of dissenting voices began to coalesce within the Senate. Those that saw the hierarchy of interests coupled with the weaknesses of the central regime began to seek to break away. Strong economic factors, such as taxation and trade barriers, also began to attract the interests of private corporations, banks, and large economic interests to seek an alternative to the Republic's meddling. At the head of the separatist movement was Count Dooku, a disaffected former Jedi who had seen the Republic and Jedi Order stray from the ideals that they preached, and had started to unite the desperate dissenters from within the Republic. Dooku, using his political and financial ties as both a member of the Royal House of Sereno, gave the Raxus address from a hijacked Republic communication station over the planet of Raxus Prime. Initiated by his official renunciation of the Republic, 
the Jedi and called for separation. Many planets, corporations, and other vested parties quickly heeded the call and began leaving the Republic, organizing themselves as a confederacy of independent systems. Although the entities that composed this confederation was as diverse in its members as it was in their philosophies, goals, and objectives, some sought to destroy the Republic, others to create an alternative system of governance. Others still had their fill of central authority and were uninterested in further intergalactic governance. Composition The Confederacy of Independent Systems, or CIS, had coalesced into the leading Separatist Council and the subservient Separatist Parliament. The Council was made up of mostly private business interests, who had the actual capital and manufacturing capability to compete with the Republic. Despite the wishes of their other Separatists, they moved toward open war with the Republic, and relied on the construction of massive droid armies to challenge its hegemony. At the head of the council was Count Dooku, who, unbeknownst to the galaxy at large, had become Darth Tyrannus, and served an even more elusive Sith Lord known as Darth Sidious. Dooku had an assortment of personal assassins and warriors at his disposal, and he had been responsible for commissioning the clone army of the Republic after the assassination of his friend Sifo Diaz. Dooku had various apprentices and dark side acolytes of his own, including Asajj Ventress, Savage Opress, Sado, Trenox, Vinok, Karok, and was responsible for the creation of the infamous cyborg general Grievous. He had also hired a variety of bounty hunters and mercenaries to achieve special objectives, including the likes of Cad Bane, Aura Singh, and Dirge, among many more. Newt Gunray, Viceroy of the Trade Federation Gunray had been the primary contact and maintained a direct relationship with the secretive Darth Sidious. Gunray had a personal grudge against Senator Padme Amidala and continually tried to have her assassinated, even hiring the infamous bounty hunters Django Fett and Zam Wessel to make an attempt on Padme's life. Gunray was the third in line of leadership succession, as after the deaths of Count Dooku and General Grievous, Gunray became the head of the Separatists. The Trade Federation supplied the CIS military with the majority of its frontline soldiery in the form of B-series battle droids and their variants, vulture starfighter droids, tanks and heavy support vehicles, and capital ships along with a small force of organic soldiers, including the Neomodian Gunnery Battalion and the Neomodian Home Defense Legion. The Trade Federation was based out of the Neomodian homeworld of Cato Neomodia. San Hill, Chairman of the Intergalactic Banking Clan. A moon from the planet Munalinst. Sanhill had been tutored in the ways of finance by Higo Demansk of Demansk Holdings after the death of his father. He had been groomed for leadership and eventually ascended to chairman of the Intergalactic Banking Clan. Being one of the Confederacy's second largest financial backers, the Banking Clan attempted to maintain some form of financial ties with the Republic for a chance at profiting from both sides of the war, remaining officially neutral while Sanhill joined the Confederacy. The banking clan would supply the droid army with Hailfire droids, early IG series droids, and frigates to the fleet. Hill, along with the Genosian P Poggle the Lesser, had been responsible for the creation of General Grievous, as the Kaleshi warlord had once been an enforcer for the bank. Intergalactic banking clan was highly influential, its name referring to the extent of its powers reaching as far as halfway out to the nearest satellite galaxy. It controlled debts, credits, and information for many governmental worlds, trade cartels, and commerce guilds. It had fallen under the influence of the Sith for many years prior to the Clone Wars, 
and was even one of the fi- initial financiers of the clone army. The banking clan would benefit from the crushing debts incurred by the Clone Wars from both sides of the conflict. The clan would survive the war and become a principal financial backer for the restructuring of the imperial currency and would go on to be a creditor to the Galactic Federation Triumvirate. Paso Argente, Magistrate of the Corporate Alliance Having the dual role as a senator for the planet Kuivar, Argente had also been elected as magistrate of the Corporate Alliance and had been responsible for introducing Count Dooku to one Wilhoof Tarkin before the outbreak of the war. The Corporate Alliance was made up by a union of powerful corporations that exert their influence across the galaxy. The Alliance had many dealings in the Outer Rim, specifically and would use enforcers to perpetuate exploitative business practices in planetary economies. The Corporate Alliance supplied NRN-99 enforcer-class persuader droids that functioned as tanks for the droid army. Tykes of the Quarren Isolation League Guilty of corruption early on in his senatorial career, Tykes had become a senator after becoming wealthy and connected as a businessman. The Quarren had a long-standing animosity with the Mon Calamari and disputed and had often led to open warfare. Tykes would represent his species rather than their world's interests to the Galactic Senate, while the Mon Cala had representatives of their own. The Quarren Isolation League was a much smaller contributor to the CIS, but pledged their services to Count Dooku nonetheless seeking to leverage their new benefactors against the Mon Calamari. In exchange, the Corin would help the CIS with soldiers and assist with aquatic warfare, and as laborers to build ships for the Separatists. Watt Tambor, foreman of the Techno Union. Skakoans rarely leave their homeworld, but Watt Tambor was not typical for his kind. Born to the Kremlin clan, Tambor would leave his homeworld often to pursue a career as an industrialist and engineer on the planet Metalorn. He rose through the ranks of the Techno Union and had been a talented combat engineer, his ascent both attributable to his talent but also due to the patronage of one Hugo Damask. Tambor had developed a high pressure methane suit to protect him from worlds that were not suitable to his Skakoan physiology. Tambor had also become the executive of Bactoid Armor Workshop, a weapons design and manufacturing firm, having provided the Trade Federation with arms during the Naboo invasion. Citing financial losses, Tambor moved much of his manufacturing to the Outer Rim, but truthfully, he had wanted to maximize manufacturing production cheaply and away from the eyes of the Republic, as he had already began plotting with the Galactic secessionists. Tambor was known for his calculating mind, but also his petty and vengeful demeanor, and was the genius behind the plot to create lightsaber-resistant Kurtosis battle droids. He was known for his scheming, being implicated in plots amidst weapons manufacturers, both within the Republic, but also against his fellow Separatist leaders. He led many Separatist campaigns, including the conquest of Ryloth and Orto Plutonia. He had been captured by the Republic numerous times, but had escaped just as many, often due to a mix of the loyalty of his followers and the machinations of the orchestrated war. Poe Nudo, Hypercommunications Cartel Chairperson In a Qualish former senator, Poe became disaffected with the Republic and joined the Confederacy of Independent Systems. He was appointed to lead the Hypercommunications Cartel, a parallel information system to the Republic hollow net. Poggle the Lesser, Geonosian Industries Archduke Poggle the Lesser led the Geonosian contingent of the Separatist Alliance, 
He provided the manufacturing capacity of his world to the war effort, supplying countless battle droids and super battle droids. Born to a lower caste, Pogel attained his rank when he led a revolution against the previous Archduke Hades, the vaulted, and retained the epithet, the lesser, to reflect his humble beginnings. The Archduke despised his co-separatist, Newt Gunray. He helped with the creation of General Grievous, and his engineers provided the cybernetics to the rechristened warlord. He had been captured during a second invasion of Geonosis and imprisoned with other Confederate generals, whom Loth- Warren Lothem and Watt Tambor, but had escaped his confines on Coruscant and fled to Utapau and finally Mustafar. Shu Mai, Presidente of the Commerce Guild. Shu Mai was born into poverty during one of the greatest economic depressions of her world's history. The Commerce Guild intervened and provided jobs, and Shu Mai found herself in their employ as a chief of property resources. She quickly climbed the ranks and was known to be wily, greedy, and unscrupulous. She helped to alleviate the financial problems of her world through the Commerce Guild by purchasing the planet, only to turn around and raise rents and demand tribute for herself. This move led to her election as Presidente. She was implicated in illegal schemes, but had always taken great efforts to not be directly involved in illegal activity, escaping possible repercussions. To this end, she was careful not to openly join with the Confederacy, but had made tacit and personal agreements with Count Dooku for her support. She saw the war as a means to an end, and leveraged trade routes to force other planets to succeed from the Republic, where she sought to buy them instead. In the final years of the war, Shu Mai had become embittered towards the Confederacy, as she ultimately began taking heavy financial and political losses. She, along with the other members of the Council, had ultimately joined her co-conspirators on the planet Musafar, as the war was drawn to a close, where she and other members of the Separatist Council would meet their grisly demise at the hands of the fallen Jedi-turned-Sith, Darth Vader. The Commerce Guild was many centuries old by the Clone Wars, and was a trade conglomerate made up of powerful corporations, corrupt senators, and officials. It was wealthy enough to purchase entire planets, and had the backing of powerful member corporations. It had drawn a certain level of controversy, being implicated in bribing many galactic senators to push through legislation. The Commerce Guild provided various spider droid models, ships, and battle droids to the war effort, as well as access to raw materials from their holding worlds. The guild was dissolved and absorbed by the Galactic Empire. Mirage Sintel, Most High Queen of Zagiria. The Zagirian Empire was known for its savagery, wealth, and slavery. Already an ancient enemy of the Republic, it did not take much for Queen Sintel to ally herself with the Confederacy. Her ambitions would ultimately get the better of her, as she wanted to enslave the Jedi, rather than eradicate them, as Dooku wanted. Dismissed by the Count, Queen Mirage lashed out at the Sith Lord, but was cut down. She appeared to have a sudden attack of conscience, as she lay dying and gave Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker the location of a group of enslaved to Agruda to be freed before succumbing to her wounds. The Separatist Parliament Although the Separatist High Council was largely composed of industrialists, bankers, and private corporations, the Confederacy had given a nod to legislative governance through the Separatist Parliament, also known as Separatist Senate or Separatist Congress. The vast majority of Separatists and sympathizers convened through the Parliament and was composed of thousands of member worlds, many former Senators of the Republic. They would convene on the world of Raxus Secundus, and were headed by Count Dooku as the head of state and Beck Leewise as the Congress leader. While many members of Parliament had legitimate grievances with the Republic, and many not even wanting to have started the war, their needs were often subjugated to that of the Separatist Council, 
and the darker whims of Dooku and his Sith master, Darth Sidious, who engineered the continuous war and in the end, to topple both regimes. Armed Forces The CIS military was largely composed of droids. Many biological generals were chosen from worlds seeking to separate from the Republic. Many brought their own organic soldiery as well and included the likes of the Umbra Baron military, the Nimbus commandos of Jabim, Geonosians, freelance mercenaries, pirates, and even some Mandalorians among many others. The Confederacy was also keen to sow discord among loyalist Republic worlds, fomenting rebellions and anti-Republic sentiment, such as the Jibimi nationalists led by Alto Stratus. The CIS had a large fleet and research and created many super and biological weapons, including producing some of the original schematics for the Death Star. The best of times, the worst of times. The Confederacy of Independent Systems had been the primary belligerents of the Clone Wars, and had been under the shadowy control of the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, by both direct and indirect means. The war, of course, had been orchestrated by the Dark Lord, who also represented the Republic as its Chancellor, and allowed the war to drag on for his own benefit and rise to power. The war was a bit of a mixed bag for the CIS. Some organizations, such as the Intergalactic Banking Clan, had become more powerful and wealthy as, direct, as a direct result of the war, while others, such as the Corporate Alliance, would be dissolved and absorbed into the Empire. The CIS relied heavily on droids as the backbone of their military, having a smaller population from which to draw soldiers, but whose immense wealth could finance and mass-produce everything from infantry assets to star cruisers. It has been estimated that the droid army numbered in the Quintillions and vastly outnumbered their enemies in the Grand Army of the Republic. Despite the controlled and engineered nature of the Clone Wars, the galaxy at large had suffered immensely. Planets were ravaged, innumerable civilian casualties, and even the common biological soldiery of the Republic and the CIS had all died for ultimately nothing. The sacrifice of the clones fighting for the ostensible freedom provided under the Republic had been responsible for the rise of tyranny, and those fighting for independence had lost it as the Empire took control of the galaxy. Thanks for flying with us. Jordan here. Just wanted to let everyone know what's happening here at the Star Lords podcast. Star Lords is now on Discord. If you would like to join the Star Lords Cantina Discord server, you can find a link in the description or on any of our social media accounts. Reach out with a DM or email. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter by searching the Star Lords podcast. Go ahead and give our page a like and send us a message. You can also email at starlorespodcast at gmail.com. Send us your fan art, Star Wars collections, or fan fictions, and you may even get a feature on one of our pages or even the show. Don't be afraid to offer corrections or add to any of the topics that we discuss on the show. We are also on Patreon, so if you want to help us pay the bills, as well as get a few awesome perks like bonus episodes, access to the private Facebook group, or the VIP section of the Discord server. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash star lores and sign up for as little as one US dollar a month. And finally, make sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher app or YouTube 
as well as sending us a five-star review on iTunes. This really helps us reach a wider audience. Enjoy the rest of the show. Welcome back to the Millennial Falcon. This is Christian. This is Jordan. And we're currently just sitting in the lobby of the uh, intergalactic banking clan uh, waiting to refinance our ship. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of repairs we've had to do. Yeah, it's uh, it's not been an easy couple of months. No, and this inflation, man. (laughs) It's hitting everywhere, cre- even in outer space. <laughs> credits, uh, galactic <laughs> credits are so they're like, uh, you know, worthless these days, you know. Yeah, but there are digital currencies. So what are you going to do? What are you going to move to next? I can't. Yeah, I can't move to anything. Yeah, unless maybe I can trade in kyber crystals or something. <laughs> yeah, it always comes back to a real resource, doesn't it? Yep. Um, today we're talking about the confederacy of independent systems the cis the big bads ostensibly of the clone wars but i'm going to dispute that for a couple of reasons um we're starting off with some controversy we're we're coming in hot and heavy um so first off i guess we can talk george lucas's politics become very evident in the makeup of his bad guys at least for Episode two uh, with the CIS being composed largely, at least the ruling council is composed largely of private corporations, banks, um, yeah, kind yeah. of industrialists, people you wouldn't. Uh, Has a very like robber baron feel to Yeah, it. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're all like very corrupt, like have no, you know, scruples. Like, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> Um, arguably from a certain point of view, <laughs> yeah, yes, everything from a certain point of view. Um, yeah, it's so one thing that kind of doesn't make sense is a lot of the breakaway factions from the CIS that aren't emphasized are those worlds that became frustrated with the corruption of the Republic. A lot of these banks and corporations were built under the banner of the Republic to begin with. Um, <coughs> So it's kind of it's kind of odd that they would subjugate themselves in like the Confederate Parliament, let's say, to the will of the very banks and corporations that they're trying to, I guess, expel from politics, more or less. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that didn't totally jive with me. On the one hand, it looks like you had Lucas really trying to, you know, put together the big bads. Um but then I think other writers kind of started getting involved to make the CIS a little more sympathetic and not yeah. just have a black and white right. war. Um, and again, like... Add some shades of gray. Yeah. Um, and having some, yeah, sympathetic separatists who have, like, legitimate grievances against the Republic who right. see the corruption of the Republic. I mean, it is a little more believable. I think, you know, if you look at, like, the original Star Wars series, it is somewhat cartoonish how bad the bad guys are yeah. and how good the good There's guys are. There's irredeemable yeah. qualities to the bad guys, and the, and the good guys can do no wrong. Yeah. Show me some... Uh, some uh, rebel terrorists, yeah, yeah, you know, killing civilians, yeah. and, and it's not it's not to say that they didn't have like flaws, the good characters, but it is it's more like it, it's more like they they were just always morally correct, yeah, you and know? always on the high ground, yeah. yeah. And there's no yeah no nuance, yeah. So yeah, I, I think again that the initial thing was supposed to be this black and white kind of comparison that slowly evolved as the Clone Wars project progressed, yeah. and you had more writers getting involved to kind of like tamper things down a little bit um corporatism isn't good (laughs) also though um and it's obvious that like i get really strong afghanistan war vibes from everything from like the battle of geonosis obviously there's those vietnam war illusions but definitely it came out very early on in in the early aughts i thought the second film came out like didn't it come out like oh one i think it was a little later but it was in the early aughts yeah maybe oh two yeah. But that that I remember O one and O two and like the Afghanistan war was like everyone seemed to be for it. I don't remember anyone being opposed to it. Yeah. Initially. People are like opposed to it now in after hindsight. it lasted twenty years, <laughs> right? But <Yeah. laughs> that in the first couple of years everyone was like, Yeah, go get those Taliban. It came and, out in O two, which was like very yeah close to like the Are you sure he was writing No no no, I'm not saying he oh, was. Okay, I'm okay. saying in hindsight, like I'm seeing a lot of illusions. I don't okay. know if it was intentional, 
there's also like Vietnam is yeah, often compared I to Afghanistan. Vietnam, because he kind of grew up. In yeah, that and that era. would make sense more. Yeah. But then you talk about Lucas, you know, writing the Ewoks as Viet Cong. So like, what side <laughs> is he on, right? <laughs> but <laughs> so that kind of puts a hole in that ship. Anyways, I'm just saying, I'm speaking for myself, right? Like, kind of the whole invasion of this desert planet, this kind of like dodgy war. That's true. Um, yeah. Even though the banks aren't necessarily like the Taliban that they're fighting. The banks and the like weapons manufacturing firms and stuff were the winners of the war, right? They're the ones that made off like bandits. They're yeah. the ones that, you know, benefited from continuous warfare. Um, even sure though that, if you invested in Damask Holdings, yeah, you'd, you'd be, be making uh, bank. Yeah. <laughs> my bank my <laughs> my inflated ho- uh, credits wouldn't feel so bad. Right now. <laughs> yeah, you just have more of them. Yeah, <laughs> just get them to print more. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's just something like some observations initially of the CIS. Um, there's also kind of a mix of like, again, Lucas being an American, we're not American. So my civil war history is a little dodgy, (laughs) very loose, I think trappings of the civil American civil war. Yeah. You have like the Confederacy being the bad guys and then the Republic, you know, equivalent to the, uh, I think it was like. Wasn't it the Republic? They were they were a republic, yeah. but they're they didn't call themselves the Republic. They were called I don't know the North, the North, <laughs> whoever yeah. they were. I I know there's some war, there's some Civil War junkies that are probably screaming at their. <laughs> well, we're not probably, Americans. <laughs> probably some like high school students. That are, <laughs> um, that the Union. They went. Yeah, by the, yeah, 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 maybe the Union. Yeah. Um. So, anyways, kind of that whole idea of like this Confederacy of separatists trying to break away. And then the Union or the Republic trying to maintain them yeah. in their in their holdings. That's that's the deepest kind of civil war trappings I can pull out. The Raxus Address kind of has vibes of the Gettysburg Address. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah. I'm really like, these are very loose things. Because then if you look at it, like the Republic was okay with slavery. That was kind of like a divisive. So Star Wars, because it has so many hands in it, I feel like stuff gets muddled that shouldn't be. Yeah. So one thing that Lucas tried to emphasize was like, oh, how can how can there still be slavery in the world, right? And you know, that was kind of like a driving force. Like, yeah, the Republic isn't really, you know, doesn't really care all that much, or its influence only goes so far and blah, 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 right? But then you have people like including things like the Zygerian Empire who are just straight up slavers. And they're allied with the CIS. So it's like slavery isn't really a divisive point if both sides kind of yeah. don't care about it right yeah i never really got those vibes but it could be me reading into it too i'm totally open to to being (laughs) overly analytical and seeing ghosts that aren't there but there were just kind of some thoughts that crossed my mind while i was writing and reading and researching um an interesting kind of mirroring is the cis having a parliamentary system Okay. But then they also call it like a Congress and a Senate too. So like, again, I think that's just different authors <laughs> not realizing <laughs> that they're actually different forms of government. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, being Canadians, we have a parliamentary system. Right. Um, which is different from the American system. Yeah. Um, and like they called the head, they didn't even call the head. Like you don't have to call the head a prime minister, but typically for a parliamentary system, the, the head of government is a prime minister, but they just call them like the leader of the leader oh, okay. of the parliament or yeah. whatever. But it would have been a good, a good, cool thing to have. Not like, the chairman. No, <laughs> they're not that kind of parliament. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it could have been. It could have been a cool like comparison of different governmental systems. Like, obviously, Lucas is interested in politics, and if there weren't so many hands kind of meddling with things, they could have had a very cool contrasting system. Yeah, um, but I think they kind of lost that. Yeah, I think it's hard to be too on the nose with politics and especially in these kind of movies because then you almost have to end up taking one side and to be like polarizing in a film especially yeah. back then when those films were made is is like kind of tough you have to like pick on threads that largely everyone kind of agrees with you yeah know? It, like big broad strokes yeah. not like getting into the minutiae yeah yeah like i don't know i guess this wasn't in Star Wars, but everyone's against slavery so it, if you have it's easy to make like <laughs> slavery yeah slavery's bad guys yeah, yeah like, the slavers are the bad guys and trend oceans are yeah. often yeah <laughs> you know i i think yeah I, I don't know like 
you know, to get in like what the tax rate should be. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> Which is something that the uh, prequels did get a lot of flack for, even for the the scrolling um, openers and like getting too politically heavy, especially episode one caught a lot of flack for too yeah. much time in the Senate. It's boring. No one cares about politics. Just show me some explosions yeah. and blast your fire. I thought it's cool, but in hindsight, I appreciate it a yeah. lot more as an adult, which is funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, like the complexity of like intergalactic governance and yeah. like, I actually care what their taxation policies were. <laughs> and I, again, that's not everyone. That's not really why you come to watch star Wars. But I like that it's there and people have written yeah. about it. I mean, it opened when you do include the political aspect, it opens up to like creating sort of Machiavellian characters, right? Yeah. And, and you can appreciate a more them a lot interesting more. plot, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Darth Sidious's rise to power and yeah. like manipulating both sides of the war. Yeah. But even, even like, uh, 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 oh, what's his, he go to mask. Um, even like his whole role, Darth Plagueis's whole role, like in in the written material as well, yeah. super interesting. So, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's something I wanted to mention is like you see his name pop up in the right, backstories right, of so yeah. many characters, so you can see his influence moving yeah. through different members who would eventually rise to power. Yeah. Even like the the previous episode we did on Sifo Diaz, like yeah. he, like he's he's involved with Sifo yeah, his Diaz, shadow yeah. is everywhere, and it, that's yeah. such a cool like, it is cool yeah. menace, but, right? Like the real Phantom. He's menace. sort of like yeah, uh, he, yeah, he's sort of like a puppet master a yeah. little bit. Yeah, well, yeah. that's totally his thing, right? Yeah. Like that's that's why he's famous. That's his Sith trait. Yeah, um, and then obviously Sidious takes after his master in that in that manner too. Yeah. Um, funny little comment. This episode is obviously going to be political just by the nature of the CIS. Yeah. And again, I'm going to come back to them as being more sympathetic in a minute, but I just want to get this stuff out of the way. Newt Gunray allegedly um, was kind of named after uh, Congressman Newt Gingrich, who's a Republican, <laughs> and was also oh, yeah. influ I, I influenced Newt, by Newt Ronald Gingrich. Reagan as well, and <laughs> the Republican Revolution of 1994. Um, so, I, like... Lucas's politics are very obvious sometimes when he's writing, but at least they're blended enough that like it's not clear. It's not clearly, yeah. you know. And I think even like his politics, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s would probably be a lot different than the politics of today. Oh yeah, he's yeah. A, <laughs> he's a, he's the corporation that he swore to destroy. Yeah, that's he was true. A, yeah, when he was a hippie, well, he in definitely the 70s. sold out to them. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Give, and he made bank doing it. I'm sure he's not sorry either. Uh, yeah. Well, he's a little sorry. He's come out and said that he's not happy with his creative choices, but he still did it. Yeah, it's not like he needed money. That's that's true. He yeah. was already very wealthy. Is that? totally true though i thought maybe he had been in financial trouble no uh so the story goes is okay. that he his no one wanted to carry on the legacy of it and he'd finally got convinced so disney was hounding him for a long time right yeah. but he always saw star wars as his creative baby yeah and he really didn't want to give it to anyone else he wanted to give it to someone who cared about it and who like you know like a family member is kind yeah. of was his vision but no one no one close to him expressed an interest he realized he's getting older he won't be able to do star wars forever and he didn't want star wars to die with him right so he gave it to a corporation that he thought would outlive him and yeah. do something with it and take it places and he was made all kinds of promises that disney ultimately reneged on mm. um why didn't he just like give it to me it to, Filoni, to the fans to Filoni or something <laughs> you know like i don't know yeah and the, and that's kind of for a long time people were thinking, or like cr just create the Star Wars Corporation and then yeah, make a CEO. make it his whole thing. Yeah. yeah, I you know I don't know why I wasn't there or yeah. the conversations or why you know may, maybe it was ultimately that paycheck that like yeah. literally six billion dollars. Yeah, like that might be the single biggest like franchise purchase in history. Yeah, I I know Disney had tried for a long, at least from what I heard, they tried for a long time to get. Uh, um uh harry potter too but oh really yeah but rowling didn't has no i think a few people have tried to buy buy the rights to harry Potter. i mean it's a uh it would be a massively expensive franchise to buy yeah you know, i so. like she is single-handedly yeah, billionaire yeah. off of the back of that yeah so. exactly yeah. yeah but she refuses to sell you know so and I mean, good if she did, she she would probably with her controversial statements as over the last couple of years, 
she would be written out of the history books. <laughs> yeah, right? like, people have already said they refuse to work with her. Yeah, exactly. Moving forward. <laughs> so, so. But uh, kind of got off topic. <laughs> if, if Lucas ever says anything, like he'll probably just get written out of the history books. Yeah, if he says absolutely. anything that's sort Controversial, of... Controversial. Yeah, violates the, the sort of woke sensibilities of, yeah. of Disney. But Yeah. Anyways, back to the Confederacy of Independent <laughs> <Yes>. Systems. <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay, let's paint them now. Let's look at them from more a sympathetic lens. All so right. for all, a vast majority of separatists, um, they have legitimate grievances against the Republic. Um, like I said, either their senators no longer really responded to the needs of the people. They kind of like got greedy and wealthy on their own interests, um, or would ignore, you know, like the outer rim planets They're like, Oh, you know, you don't really have anything we care about. So you're kind of second class yeah. compared to the needs and interests of the core worlds. Uh, you have some worlds who got split in the middle where you have like maybe a majority of the people have an elected representative, but the Republic comes in and says, no, like this is our guy. And okay, so they, yeah. they take the reins of power and like that would foment rebellion even within the populace of the of the not the country the planet yeah right where you'll have like separatists in their own world split right um fighting for control of their world and then you know then the republic comes in and props up maybe a regime or a dictator or you know someone who's in their pocket right and uh crushes the local opposition where we haven't seen that before <laughs> Um, so there are there are reasons that the CIS and then their reliance on battle droids versus the clone army. I'm not going to whip that one too much, but yeah, I brought it up before, right? Like the ethics of using child soldier slaves versus robots to fight your wars, right? Yeah. So, despite their and then, like it gets cartoonish sometimes. So like a lot of the generals of the CIS have like. Bad, obviously bad guy names savage oppress <laughs> and worm loathsome are two particularly heinous you know general grievous is bad but the other two are just yeah. <laughs> it's just bad guy mcbaddington yeah. right like it's just it's true it's two on the nose <laughs> it's pretty cartoonish yeah, yeah. Um, but even the Clone Wars TV series, as well as the comic books, did have certain stories that kind of tried to have more, maybe not overtly sympathetic Confederates, but at least, or Separatists, but at least, uh, like you said, graying up the picture a little bit more. Um, so I don't think, even though maybe they were controlled by corrupt incentives, I think many of them had a legitimate goal and legitimate cause. And the only re and some of them didn't even want to go to war. They wanted to peacefully separate, but because obviously Darth Sidious was in control of the game, war he wanted to topple both regimes, so he needed war as a tool, and he prolonged the war on purpose. So even if it did become like a bloody separation, it's possible that uh, it may not have dragged on as long or been as devastating if people weren't intentionally, you know, releasing capture generals or, you know, staging their own capture and things like that, and staging circumstances where conflict was inevitable and as violent as it could possibly be yeah so ultimately the real losers were the galactic community the civilians as yeah. most wars tend to be mm -hmm. um and it is kind of like a sad parallel that like oh another name that just popped in my head darth well all the sith names are kind of on the nose but darth tyrannus yeah is the leader of the confederates yeah sidious yeah, yeah. insidious <laughs> vader um but anyways, yeah, like the Republic was often seen as like fighting for liberty and like the good guys, right. but they're not. They're fighting to keep planets under their control. Yeah, yeah. And also the idea that like ultimately they were fighting for these ideals, but they directly contribute to the rise of tyranny in the end. And then those that were fighting for independence and separation also get booted on by the empire as well right yeah. so like again everyone everyone from the past loses yeah people fighting for freedom and democracy lose people fighting for independence and liberty lose yeah and the empire ultimately wins yep so it's a it's a tragic story that i'm sure we could learn no possible lessons from <laughs> <laughs> yeah but to be fair the empire's rise and fall in the grand scheme of things is actually pretty short 
Yeah, thirty years. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. the Republic. relative to like the Sith Empire <laughs> or like the Republic. Yeah, the Republic yeah. was. I don't know what was it ten thousand years or something. A long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. longer than anyone else could care to remember. Yeah. <laughs> Which used to be a hallmark of civilizations <laughs> in the past. You had like the Egyptian empires and the Syrian Empire to last for like dynasties. Yeah. You know, then, it is interesting because I don't think uh, I think those days are kind of over where you have like empires that last for like a millennia or even yeah. hundreds of years i think every it seems like since industrialization everything's every, accelerating yeah exactly yeah. like the the rise and fall of nations and and sort of the world hegemons yeah. kind of seems to accelerate ex, have accelerated um but who knows like maybe in the grand scheme of things i don't know but yeah uh, it, it's hard it's easier to look back on things than it is to try and predict things to come yeah but definitely from what we have seen like our short-lived democ- democracies have only been around like 150 years right, right? Yeah. that's nothing yeah. 200 years that's nothing compared to like these yeah. vast imperial and and like multi-lineage states and empires yeah. and civilizations yeah and yeah. that is the that is the norm the, yeah. and the norm is that every empire dies eventually so it's yeah. kind of it's crazy yeah, and deluded think, to yeah. think that your civilization will last forever. Yeah, you th- yeah, yeah. I don't know. You think the Mongols, the, uh, Rome, like Assyria, yeah, all these empires just lasted for hundreds of years. Egypt, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, and it's not to say that like, like uh, Britain used to be the world empire, right? Like, yeah. and they were the top dog, but. And they still exist today, but they're not. The they're a shadow of what yeah. they had once been. Yeah, yeah, now it's like America. You know, yeah. they're sort of the top dog in the world. And, and how, how long, long will that <laughs> last? How long will it last? I don't know. Who, who's to say, right? Like, Great. Now the CIA is following us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not today, CIA. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it is. Uh, it, it seems like a rather. Uh, but, but like the. the the rise of the galactic empire was like meteoric you know it wasn't yeah. like slow it was they they took over the republic political and uh industrial infrastructure and and just had a very strong grip over the galaxy yeah. you know so yeah it was a short time but it burned bright yeah yeah, yeah. and um, they were um uh they had very advanced weapons technology let's say <laughs> Yes. World ending technology. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So we are going to come back and revisit the CIS because there's definitely a lot more to talk about. I just wanted to give a general overview of like, okay, who are they? Who leads it? Yeah. And then we'll kind of like do more deeper dives, breaking down like probably more the CIS military because there's a lot of cool characters in there. A lot of battle droids we can talk about and types of battle droids. Again, that being their main kind of fighting force but they do have lots of cool biological soldiers too and factions and heroes yeah so we'll definitely be coming back to the cis this was just kind of like our introductory kind of political episode and then we'll come back and address more of the minutiae and technicalities of it so until next time see you later (laughs) 